Welcome to the second to the last lecture on American literary history. We're starting with Clean Slate with a new century, and uh, we're going to call this era Modernism. And you can see we're moving in new directions with modernism. It takes place during a relatively short period of time, 1910 to 1930. But so much happens during this time period in our history, right? after or actually excuse me during world war one and right before the great depression that it's worth its own time period and we had quite a lot that happened during this time period first of all we have again world war one occurs and it ends in 1919 it ends up being an amazingly important event in our history because for the first time we lose our optimism in many respects as a society up until this time we experienced two wars on our own soil and we're still able to maintain our optimism and this uh, events of World War One sort of destroyed that and in many respects because we sent so many of our young men over on foreign soil and they didn't come back I mean at least if you knew your son died in Ohio you could maybe travel to Ohio uh, but if your son died in the trenches in France or Germany or Italy um, there really wasn't any way for you to ever see uh, even where your loved one's final resting place was. And, and we really became disillusioned with the experiences uh, surrounding World War I. In fact, it instituted a great sense of loss and a, and a sense of just really confusion about why we did what we did and, and we did what we always do. And our actions, you know, to, to fight for independence and freedom and the rights of others, that's the old way. And some, for some reason, that old way got us into a big lot of trouble. And we became disillusioned. And that's an important word to make sure you write down. To be disillusioned means to lose your hopes and dreams. And that's what many of the people during this time period that's the way they felt as a result of the experience in World War I. Well, on a positive note, uh, we did come out of World War I still a world power. And immigration is exploding. We still have many people coming to our shores. We're not very happy to let the German people in during this time period. So if you come from German ancestry and your relatives came during this time period, um, you're pretty lucky that you're here because we sent so many of them back or even just didn't give them citizenship as a result, again, of World War One. We also see a lot of technological advances. They're continuing. Uh, we're improving on the the car and the telephone and so we're becoming a more mobile and a more highly communicable society in america um we decide that we're going to break with the past though again the old ways didn't work we got into world war one based on old principles and, and old values and those old values didn't get us very far and so we are going to leave things in the past and move forward we see a lot of people a lot more people moving to the cities and that also is a result of world war one when you think of the young men who went overseas and the young women who went overseas to serve in various capacities um, if they did make it home they lived a lifetime of experiences in two years and some of them just really were not able to go back to a really quiet mundane boring life they needed more excitement they didn't need more activity and so many of them move off of the farms and into the cities we still have quite a wide agrarian society but much less so than before um, another extreme effect, I guess you could say, of World War I, something that you're going to learn more about in your history classes, is the sense of being isolated. And we actually called it, it was a political philosophy and approach at the time called isolationism. In the 1920s, uh, the League of Nations was created and we ran away. And we said, no, not for us. Uh, we did that once. It got us in a really awful war. We weren't happy with how it, it ended. Um, yeah, supposedly we won, but at what cost? And so we sort of closed our borders up and had a great big party. And we called that party the Roaring Twenties. Uh, or the Jazz Age. And later in the year, we are going to read a novel entitled The Great Gatsby, which is set during the Jazz Age. But it was also recently made into a major motion picture you may have seen it, and you may have gotten um, Baz Luhrmann's interpretation of what the Jazz Age was all about. And it was it was crazy. It was wild. There were a lot of parties. A lot of jazz musicians rose to fame. Uh, here's one band leader, Duke Ellington, who you may have heard of. Um, and of course, it's really hard to have a great big party, adult party, that is, when you don't have the alcohol to go with it. And 
we had prohibited the use, the sale and the distribution, if you will, of alcohol during this time period, mostly because we were a terrible nation of alcoholics. And it had gotten so bad that a group of uh, people got together and said, we need to make a change. We need to outlaw the sale and distribution of alcohol, and they called it prohibition. And, of course, that didn't stop anyone because if people wanted to party, they were going to find a way to get the alcohol that they needed. Um, so we have some interesting things happening in our society as a result of the prohibition of alcohol. We have uh, clubs called speakeasies that crop up. And speakeasies were interesting. They came in many different varieties. Um, they could be just a traveling club that uh, you just had to kind of find out where the location was, like a traveling party. Uh, some of them you had to have a password to get in. Maybe they were in the upper room of a small little establishment that you would never suspect would be a, a club. Some speakeasies were very elaborate. They had great music and, you know, they were great jazz clubs. And they also had some pretty high-tech equipment so that if there was a police raid, you could push some buttons, um, and things could spin around and go under the floor and go behind the wall and you would hide all remnants of alcohol. Of course, they do a great representation of that and sensationalizing that in movies, but they definitely were in existence. But if you weren't quite so daring and you didn't want to go out to the speakeasy and you couldn't get the password and you still needed to drink, um, many people got recipes to make something called bathtub gin. And it really exactly is the description um, that it is, is that people brewed alcohol in their porcelain fixtures, in their sinks, in their bathtubs. Now, there were some problems with bathtub gin, as, gin, as you can imagine. Uh, one of the big issues with bathtub gin is you could go blind. It could be too strong. The proof could be too high. And you could, you could definitely go blind. Uh, a little bit more serious effect of bathtub gin, you could die from drinking uh, too strong a proof of bathtub gin. And sometimes that death would be quick, uh, and other times it could be a slow, painful death over the course of many years as the alcohol would eat away your liver. And there was really not a thing you could do about it at that point once the damage had been done. Um, now, when you prohibit something as widespread, and widely used as alcohol. You're going to have people who are going to want to profit from that. And this is a gentleman you might be very aware of, gangster Al Capone, and he was heavily involved with the sale and distribution of illegal alcohol. Interestingly enough, however, Al Capone, when he finally did go to jail, did not go to jail for breaking the laws of prohibition. He went to jail for breaking income tax laws, for income tax evasion. So even the moral of that story is even criminals have to pay their taxes. Now, uh, the Roaring Twenties also offered us some really interesting changes in fashion. And we have women entering into the scene here and revolutionizing the fashion. Up until this point, women had to wear their hair long, but then they had to roll it up into updos and buns and things. Uh, and they had to wear dresses that really went all the way down to their ankles. Flappers changed all that. Um, flappers are women, usually young women, not always single women, but definitely of the younger ilk. And they would do things like um, go to college and cut their hair and wear dresses that showed their knees. Th those ladies are very daring right there showing their knees for us. But even showing your ankles was pretty daring. They would smoke sometimes in public and they would drink and they would drive around in cars unchaperoned with boys and they would definitely definitely attend lots of parties and have fun. This was revolutionary girls. So women were not, these were stepping outside the, the original roles and boundaries of women and uh, made a big splash and led to us getting the right to vote in 1920. During this time period, too, we have a very serious and um, important development, something we call the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance was a recognition, basically, that there is a whole group of people, at least 50% of our American population, who as up to this time had not been recognized for their artistic contributions to our society. And basically, a group of people got together and said, we really need to shine a light on and focus on the music, musical contributions, the artistic abilities, and the literary contributions that African American people can bring to American society. And it was somewhat controversial. Um, however, the attempt was, um, in many respects, to combat the stereotypes, the Aunt Jemima, the Uncle Tom, um, the the pickaninnies they used to call the little African American children and, and when they drew them in pictures. And they really wanted to combat those negative stereotypes um, with the reality 
of what African Americans could contribute to society and offer a more, and excuse me for the typo there, a more diverse um, opportunities for them to have employment. And they definitely did gain quite a lot of recognition through art and music and literature. Unfortunately, um, much of the value of the Harlem Renaissance, at least in the art world, ended with the Great Depression. Certainly, the jazz music and the blues music and the literature of writers like Langston Hughes and Claude McKay um, continue on to this day. And here is a piece of beautiful artwork that is entitled The Brown Madonna. And it is another example of how this kind of um, approach was supposed to break those stereotypes of the, um, up until this point, of the role of African Americans in our society. Now, let's move on to literature and look at one of the most important elements of modernist literature, and you should all know this, make it new, make it new, make it new. Ezra Pound was a gentleman who wrote a lot of poetry, and he sort of picked up where Walt Whitman left off and said, hey, you know that free verse thing that that guy did in the late 1800s? Let's keep doing it. Let's do more of it. Let's be even more crazy and wild. And again, it goes along with that whole widespread uh, cultural approach to break free from tradition, break, break free from the styles of the past with regards to writing. And there's someone breaking a pencil. Um, it's basically throwing open the doors of possibility, and there's a great increase in psychological um, issues in characters and the human mind. And of course, this is the time period where you have Freud and all of those people making great um, explorations of the mind. And so we definitely want to see some of that in literature. So we're experimental in form, and there's even more free verse than there was with Walt Whitman. Modernist literature shows instead of tells, which sometimes can make it awfully hard because it doesn't tell us what a character necessarily is feeling. It just shows us what the character is saying, and we have to figure out the emotions ourselves. Um, also, modernist literature did some really crazy wild things. Um, William Faulkner was one of the first to do it in our country, but he copied James Joyce from Ireland with the style of stream of consciousness. And basically, it's an opening up of your brain and recording what's going on in there as it's going on, complete with no capitalization, lots of run-on sentences, uh, no punctuation, because your brain doesn't work that way. You don't think in complete sentences. You don't think in grammatically correct sentences. So when an author attempts to record what's going on in your brain at any given time, at any moment, you can imagine what is going to happen you're going to get a lot of confusing writing, and that's definitely what we see. Um, it's a skill that takes many years to hone, uh, both to, to write it and sometimes even to read it. And we're going to read a little bit of stream of consciousness this year and practice even doing some writing of it, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. In the literary world, um, some key players for us actually are people who decided that they didn't want to be Americans anymore as a great result of World War One, and one of them was named Gertrude Stein. There she is. Uh, she stayed over in Paris, and she had a little what they call a parlor or a salon in Paris, where she collected, if you will, many of the great writers of our time period, American writers like Ernest Hemingway and Ezra Pound and Robert Frost for a time, who you know, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. And she called them the lost generation because she felt that not only did we lose a whole generation, a large chunk of our generation of young men as a result of war casualties, but we also see that these people lost their optimism. So a lost, a, a physical loss, a literal loss, as well as a figurative loss. That's why she called them the lost generation. She was a great muse, very much like Emerson was during the transcendentalism time where people gathered and flocked to his library to talk about all these philosophical ideals. Gertrude Stein herself collected a lot of writers and they flocked to her salon, only they had to leave the country and actually um, disclaim, if you will, their citizenship in order to, to really do that. Um, I have an example of modernist poetry, which you may or may not find appealing, uh, but one of the words that we use to describe this kind of poetry, again, it's free verse, but we have another name for it too. It's called imagism, and of course, you know an image is a picture, 
and imagism is a focus on poetry as more of a visual. Now that sounds kind of weird, right? Because you're reading words. But if you think of poets like E.E. E. Cummings, who wrote poems with all lowercase letters, you kind of know what that means. So how the poem looks on the page becomes very important, but also the image that the poem discusses becomes quite important. And here's an example of a poem by William Car Carlos Williams called The Red Wheelbarrow. And this is the poem. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Hmm, doesn't sound like much, does it? And there's the image that that poem conveys. And you can look at the line breaks and you can look at the stanza breaks and start to maybe put together some meaning about how the poem looks on the page. Or if you don't even want to do that with imagism, you can just think about the picture that the poem describes and you're good. Now with modernism literature, we need to make sure we approach it in the right way. And the first thing that we need to remember is to bring our own emotions. Often in modernist literature, and especially in the piece we're going to read by Ernest Hemingway, we need to bring our own emotions. We need to just look at what's going on in the dialogue between these two characters and figure out things for ourselves, because the mystery of the message is there somewhere. And so maybe as difficult as it was to wade through an Edgar Allan Poe piece because of its complexity, uh, we have the opposite problem with modernist literature. Sometimes it's a little bit too stark, a little bit too sparse and we have to try to bring things into it to um, find the real meaning. And there's the mystery. And finally, the key authors during this time period, if we look at a lot of these names, uh, Hilda Doolittle, Amy Lowell, and our women. And then we have Langston Hughes, who is an African-American writer. There are many, many more in this short time period. Um, actually, they live much longer than the 20 years of this time period, but they got their start during this time period. There are many, many more who wrote during this period in our history. And it was just an explosion of newness. And again, as I said, Ezra Pound said, make it new. And we did. And it was a break with the past. All right, we only have one more lecture to go. So hang in there, stay tuned, and we'll get back to you soon.